as the first seed of resurrection raised, Jesus is now the gardener of the resurrection, cultivating new life in all who believe. He's the first resurrected from the dead, cultivating new life in all who believe. Do you believe this morning? Jesus is your gardener. On Good Friday, Jesus was buried in a garden. He, he had died on the cross, and Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy council member, and Nicodemus, another council member, decided that they needed to do something, because even though they were members of the Sanhedrin, um, they, were, they had not consented to the plot against Jesus. And, and whilst they couldn't stop this travesty of justice, they wanted him to have a burial fit for a king. They were secret disciples of Christ. So they'd obtained permission from the governor, Pontius Pilate, to move the body from the cross, and Joseph donates his own tomb, freshly hewn from lifestone, a tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Jesus, Joseph gives his tomb, and Nicodemus, not to be outdone, buys a hundred pounds of spice. This is an extravagant gift. Mary of Bethany anointed Jesus with one pound of spice. Nicodemus makes this incredible gesture of devotion by buying a hundred pounds of spice. Can you imagine the cost of that? But he's a wealthy man, and he wants to to be extravagant in his, his praise for Jesus. So Jesus is buried in that garden, in that tomb where no one else had ever been laid, so that the Christ born from a virgin womb could be buried in a virgin tomb in a garden. A garden is a place where you cultivate and you, and you grow things. Sarah's been busy the past couple of days planting all sorts of vegetables in, in, in our garden, because the garden is a place where you cultivate and, and grow things. On the Saturday after Good Friday, the Son of God was, if you like, a holy seed, lying in a quiet garden, sown in a peaceful garden. On Easter Sunday, the garden brought forth the first fruits of resurrection. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ declared to be the Son of God by resurrection from the dead. Amen. The first seed raised by God in the garden of resurrection has become the gardener. So when Mary Magdalene supposed him to be the gardener, we can think that she was exactly right. It's no mistake at all. It's in fact a prophetic statement. The first Adam was given this vocation by God. He said, tend the garden. Look after the garden. The original human calling is to be a gardener, to cultivate God's goodness in God's creation. Not to exploit it, not to abuse it, but to tend and care for it. But this second Adam, the first Adam, sorry, failed in his task. And the human experience became a, a ruined landscape. A wasteland of war and sin and sorrow, of misery and poverty and suffering. And we can still see that. But this second Adam, he'll succeed in his task. And Christ will restore the ruined garden. Amen. No matter what we see going on around us, God is working on cultivating his garden through you and through me. And he will restore all things. And it'll be better than it was in the first place. Hallelujah. We have, to use a, uh, a complicated word, an eschatology of hope. A view of the end times which involves hope at its, its very core. Shandos reminded me before the, the meeting of a series of teachings Tony Ling did on Revelation back in 2003. And he says he can hear my voice on the recording saying that's right. And how, how old does that make me feel? <laughs> Sorry, it's fine. Um, Tony Ling's books on Revelation are great because right at the heart of everything Tony writes is hope. And our view of the end times is that we can be filled with hope because Christ is restoring all things. 
John of Patmos puts it like this. He says, it is well in the city because it's going to be a garden city. This is a power phrase called the New, New Jerusalem. The city has a river which runs through it. And on either side is the tree of life repeated. And it's bearing 12 types of fruit. The garden is being restored. That's the gardener at work. Jesus is a gardener, and what he's cultivating is you. It's us, us who believe. We are resurrection plants in the garden of God. The risen Christ is at work in your life and in my life to nurture and cultivate resurrection life in you and in others. And that's amazing. It's a beautiful thing. David said it like this. I'm like an olive tree, flourishing in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. Jesus is the steadfast love of God. He's not angry with you, and you are not a lost cause. Whatever you're feeling right now, you can look at plants in gardens and think that an individual plant, to all intents and purposes, looks like it's withering, looks like it's, it's dead or dying. But Jesus says, no, it just needs taking care of. It just needs taking care of. It just needs me to work on it a little bit, and then it's going to burst back into life, and it's going to look beautiful. Isaiah the prophet looks to the future and says, instead of the thorn bush will come up the juniper. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. This garden's going to be filled with good fruit, and that's why we have hope for the future. Our eschatology is not about doom and gloom. It's about thorn bushes becoming junipers, and it's about briars becoming myrtles. Isaiah also says, as a garden causes what's sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord will cause justice and praise to sprout up before all nations. And he does it by working on the lives of his people. Because Jesus is a gardener cultivating resurrection life in in you and me. Jesus is he's not a conductor punching tickets on a train journey to heaven. The Christian perspective is not nearly so much as about going from, from earth to heaven as it's about bringing heaven to earth. We pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth like it is in the heavens. That's what we look for. We're the planting of God. Do you know what? You, each one of you, you are a tree of righteousness. A tree of righteousness, rooted to the earth, pulling down heaven by your faith. That's amazing, isn't it? I want you to know this morning that God the Father loves you. We've been singing about that this morning. We've been, we've, we've been worshipping Jesus for that this morning. But I want you to know it so that you know that you know that you know that God loves you. He's not angry with you. Whether you're going through good times or bad times, we sang a song about you're there for me in the storm. Well, he's there for me also when, when it's good. In the good times and the bad times, he's, he's there for us. He loves us and he's not angry with us. Jesus says to, to Mary Magdalene, go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to my father. He doesn't stop there, does he? He says, I'm ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. His father and your father. As the father loves the son, he loves you. You're part of the family. Jesus is a gardener cultivating and tending resurrection life in you. But the gardener doesn't work in a ruined landscape and fix it in one visit. Gardens are a project that happen over a period of time. And our souls, if you like, are the landscape in which he's working. It's a, it's a lifetime's work. When, when, he, when, we, when we acknowledge Jesus as Lord, we are saved there and then. The job is done. There's no question from there about our salvation. But that doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't continue to work on us by the Holy Spirit as he continues to, to cultivate our souls and to, and, and to work on our faith and to show us his plans. A gardener's work is, is intimate. 
gardeners get their fingers right into the soil. And, uh, and we are humans formed from the humus, the soil. The gardener has his living hands on living things, bringing forth and cultivating life. That's amazing. Do you know what? No matter where you are and what you think this morning, your life is not so messed up that Jesus can't bring you into a flourishing state. If you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you don't need to work any of this stuff out in your head. You just need to take a leap of faith and say, Jesus, be my God and attend to my soul. Grow faith in me. Because at the moment, it's all overgrown with weeds and, and thorns and such like. And you, you might be thinking about your own life, whether you, whether you have the relationship with Jesus or you don't. Nothing good grows here. Because that's a common lie that we, that we tell ourselves. It's a common lie that the enemy would like us to, to, to hear. Jesus says, if that's what you're thinking, don't worry. I can sort it out. I will sort it out. You might not always recognize Jesus as the gardener. Mary didn't. But he's there. If you're in the garden, then Jesus the gardener is there. And he's there for you because he loves you. Mary was weeping because she thought that Jesus had been taken away. But Jesus was standing right there in front of her. He'd been there all along. That's how it can be in our lives sometimes. We can't see Jesus for the, for the fog, for the trees, for whatever it is that's, that's, that's in, front of our, in front of our eyes. But if we call out to him and say, Jesus, where are you? His answer will be, I'm right here. I'm right here with you. You might not have recognized him, but he's here with you. He said that he'll never leave you and he'll never forsake you. Isn't that amazing? So if you've got a neighbor pumping carbon monoxide into your sitting room and you're thinking, I can't see Jesus for the carbon monoxide. It's, I've got black smoke in my room. What's going on? Jesus says, I'm right here and there's a solution. And then, then he provides the solution. Jesus is practical, and that was great testimony to hear this morning because I'd been praying about that, and I know others have been praying about that. And there he is delivering the answer. He doesn't just say, I can sort it out. He says, I will sort it out. Just watch me. And in the meantime, the love of Christ is demonstrated by Rose saying, yeah, you don't need to sleep getting poisoned. You can come and stay in my house. Hallelujah. That is real testimony of Jesus going on right amongst us. Trust the gardener and stay in the garden. Stay in the garden and the gardener will continue to work on you so that you can continue to flourish and that you can know what it is to have abundant life in him. Understanding that Jesus is tending to your soul will change your perspective on life so that when stuff happens, that's the polite Christian way of saying it, when stuff happens, you just let Jesus use it like fertilizer to, to help you grow. Jesus doesn't cause the stuff to happen, but if you believe that Jesus is the gardener, you can say, Jesus, use that stuff to help me grow. Use that stuff to mature the way I think. Use that stuff to build faith in me. And so he will. Because as the Apostle Paul says, God uses all things for good for those who love him and are called according to his plan. And if you're here today and you're in a relationship with Jesus Christ, that is you. You love God and you're called according to his plans. Sometimes we, uh, we get pruned, don't we? Nobody likes pruning, or being pruned anyway. I don't, frankly, I don't mind cutting stuff off plants because uh, it's about the most creative thing I can do. But I'm, but I'm, uh, I, I, I'm kind of generally told off because I've cut the wrong bit, so I uh, steer steer clear of it without firm direction. But when we are, when when the gardener gets out his shears, we don't look forward to that, do we? Because 
pruning is the painful experience of being cut back. We, we all just want to, to win all the time, don't we? And, and get, have good stuff all the time. We want more and more and better and better. But the gardener knows what he's doing. And he looks at us and he looks at us sometimes and he thinks, well, that one's a bit overgrown with pride and self-importance. Where's my shears? Let's cut that back a bit. None of us like it. None of us like being cut back. But remember, the gardener with the good heart and the green fingers, which Jesus says has nothing but your best interests in mind when stuff like that happens. Jesus' whole intent as the one who conquered death is that you should flourish and have abundant life. He puts it like this. He says, every branch of mine that bears fruit is pruned so that it can bear some more fruit. It's not punishment. When the gardener prunes in, in his garden, he, is, he, is he punishing the shrubs and the plants? No. He or she is helping them, healing them, creating an environment in which they can flourish and grow and be renewed. Even when Jesus is pruning, know that he loves you. Even on your worst day, know that he loves you. He loves every plant in his garden and he loves every one of us so much that he never leaves us alone. On that first Easter morning, Mary Magdalene meets the gardener and understands that Jesus has not left her alone. She runs off to share the good news. And that's where we finish today. Christ's resurrection is the best news. He's conquered death and he'll never leave us or forsake us. He'll never leave us alone. He sent the Holy Spirit, the counselor, to tend to our soul so that we can flourish and know him in abundance. Hallelujah.